there, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Welcome to Counting the Cost and Happy New Year. It's our first show for 2016, so we thought it was a good time to look at what's coming up this year and where the global economy might be headed. Of course, in uncertain times, that's an almost impossible task, but at the very least, we can discuss what the big business and economic stories will be in 2016. We will do that in a moment with our special panel of experts, but first this to get us started. As the old saying goes, it's the economy, stupid. And that couldn't be more true as 2016 begins. Really, the jury's still out on whether the world is heading for steady growth or if we could slip back into recession. In the United States, Janet Yellen at the Federal Reserve will continue her efforts to nudge interest rates higher as the country continues its recovery from the financial crisis. In Europe and Japan, though, Mario Draghi and Haruhiko Kuroda will be looking for ways to stimulate growth. And of course, the elephant in the room is China. Will we see a continued slowdown, or even worse, a hard landing? The IMF says Chinese growth will slow to 6.3%, down from 6.8% this year. But others are even more pessimistic. It matters, because China is the customer of last resort for so many of the world's commodities, everything from oil to iron ore. Any effect will be felt disproportionately in the emerging markets, Russia and Brazil are already in recession, and a further slowdown in China could hit the less developed world hard. And that plays into one of the big themes of 2016, how low can oil prices go and what that means for the producing countries. We saw in early December that OPEC was unable to agree on output cuts to push up prices, and anecdotal evidence suggests sovereign wealth funds have been selling assets to meet the shortfalls. Certain countries, of course, benefit from low oil prices, though. India, for one, is expected to see lower inflation, helped by the lower cost of fuel imports. But almost everyone benefits from increased trade, and this year should see some big changes. Two events could give global business a boost, at least according to their supporters. In April, the expansion of the Panama Canal is scheduled for completion, allowing ships more than two and a half times the size of the current limit to cross from the Atlantic to the Pacific or vice versa. And more controversially, this year could see the ratification of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, between 12 countries. Those countries account for 40 percent of world trade, but opponents say the TPP will make it easier for companies to move jobs overseas. In Europe, the Greek financial crisis could rear its head again if Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras can't win approval for the spending cuts and the tax hikes and the labour market reforms and privatisations that creditors have demanded. And British Prime Minister David Cameron will spend most of the year trying to persuade the country that its future lies in the European Union. A referendum could come in October. And finally, of course, it's election year in the United States, and whether you like it or not, Whoever sits in the Oval Office will be making the kind of decisions that change all of our lives. Right, lots to talk about, so best we get into it. And here is our expert panel, starting over in Nottingham uh, in the United Kingdom with Professor Steve Tsang, who is head of the Contemporary Chinese Studies School at Nottingham University. In London is Razia Khan, Chief Economist for Africa, Global Research at Standard Chartered Bank. And in Brussels, Mark Perini, the former EU ambassador to Turkey and a number of other Middle East countries. He is now a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe. Thank you so much for your time. We've got a lot to get through in a short space of time. So let's get going with, I think, the most obvious one, and that is what happens in the United States this year. We are expecting, and I would point out we're having this discussion before the decision in December is made, but we are expecting, I think, an increase in rates this year. Razia Khan, let me start with you. The knock-on effect, the potential for knock-on effects here. If rates go up, money starts to come back to the United States, what happens? Well, this is where we think it gets really interesting. Of course, much of the global economy has spent a whole year anticipating that the Fed would start raising interest rates. And in a sense, once we get at least the first tightening out of the way, this should allow the Fed to adopt a much more dovish tone, in our view. Standard Chartered has something of a non-consensus view. We think that given where we are in the U.S. economic cycle, in the upswing, some of the vulnerabilities that have emerged in terms of the earnings outlook, the impact of the 
stronger dollar, whether there is enough momentum to keep this cycle going, we actually take the view that before the end of 2016, the Fed is likely to be cutting interest rates again. Mm. So it's a sign, really, Razia, that the United States is in good health or in much improving health. And it's been, whilst we focused on a lot of other places like the China's and the emerging markets, the U.S. in the background has just slowly kept edging forward. Well, of course, there has been this momentum behind growth and conditions should finally be robust enough for the Fed to see our rates going up. We will finally see lift off. But in terms of how much more is needed and with further tightening, this is where the implications for the global economy become much more important. For the better part of a year, some would argue even longer, we have seen considerable volatility in emerging markets. We have already seen out flows from those emerging markets, partly in reaction to the commodity cycle, partly in reaction to this anticipation of Fed tightening. And the question is, when do we call the turn? When do things start to look slightly better for emerging markets, where we should see a lessening of these outflows, perhaps in conjunction with this more dovish Fed that we anticipate in 2016? OK, and we'll come back to emerging markets a little bit later. I'd like to bring Professor Steve Sang into the conversation now to talk a bit about China. We talk about US on the rise there, but we've also been talking a lot about China on the decline. What to expect? I mean, we've been we've been flagging this up for a long time. What are your thoughts for China in 2016? Well, the Chinese economy is slowing down. It is not surprising to you or indeed to the Chinese government. I think we are seeing that happening already. The Chinese government also expected that to happen and this is reflected in the language which President Xi Jinping used of the new normal. Mm -hmm. The question really is how they are going to manage that economic slowdown and how they will use that economic slowdown to rebalance the economy and rebalance it away from very heavy dependence on export and on infrastructural investment and to more domestic driven consumption. Do you think the Chinese are managing it well, though? We talk a lot about how other countries might react uh, and, and deal with the Chinese slowdown, but is China itself managing this well? Because it, it's got to be that gradual move backwards, doesn't it? And, and, and as you say, move to a domestic economy. Well, the Chinese government would like to think that it's managing it very well, <laughs> but the reality is that the management of the Chinese economy is something which the Chinese government has found surprises. For example, the uh, stock market crash in Shanghai in the summer. This was not something that they had expected, and when it happened, they did not manage it terribly well. And they've spent a huge amount of the foreign exchange reserve as a result in orders to uh, deal with the ramifications of it. Now, there will be other surprises uh, in 2016 that the Chinese government will have to deal with. I think their reactions will be that um, they will try to allow the market to play a so-called decisive role. Mm. But when the economy or the stock market or whatever gets into serious problems, then they will go back into intervention and try to st stabilise the economy and therefore stabilise society and the regime. OK, we're jumping around a bit here, but I do want to bring Mark into the conversation in Brussels, so I want to look at Europe as well. And just, as I say, we're getting an overview of different regions in the world, Mark. Uh, Europe seems quieter now. It feels like things have calmed down, at least on the surface, a little bit. What is your feeling? I mean, Greece is still the wild card, but, but what are your feelings about Europe as a whole, given how fearful we were not long ago about the euro? The euro crisis and Greece uh, will be managed in 2016. I see uh, two external challenges and two internal challenges. Uh, internally, obviously, uh, the debate on Brexit, but also the growing difference with Central European countries on the concept of liberal democracy, mm -hmm. which is being revealed as the extreme right parties or rightist parties, populist parties, make progress across Europe. And externally, uh, Europe has faced in 2015 a massive refugee crisis, which will continue uh, in 2016, perhaps a bit more controlled uh, and of course there is a, a winter lull in any migration crisis mm. so this will resurface at the end of march but of course the biggest challenge externally will be isis uh, this has been 
uh, a huge challenge in France and other countries. It has driven uh, decisions in the UK and Germany towards military intervention, and this will get bigger in 2016. But that's interesting. You think a, an external threat like ISIS is more of a threat than, say, Greece has been, because Greece was always seen as the potential trigger point, I guess, uh, for any further Europe problems. Yes, indeed, because uh, for the, the Greek crisis, the Euro, you have tools and you have institutions, and it looks awfully complicated uh, from the outside, but you have a, a, a set of people used to work together, a set of institutions. So it's awfully expensive, complicated, but you have all the toolbox. Uh, on something like ISIS, you, you don't have it. Uh, you don't have a European defense, uh, so you have to piece together uh, various uh, policies. Uh, some countries intervene, some don't, some have the capacity, some don't. Uh, and also uh, ISIS is a moving target. Uh, ISIS is very big today in Syria and Iraq. Uh, in a few months' time, it will be very big in Libya. Mm. So, OK, here's what I'm getting from all three of you at the moment. I'm addressing all three of you now, right now. It's a very up-and-down mixed picture. And that's the nature of, of economics. That's the nature of geopolitics. Obviously, we can't predict what's going to happen. Razi, why don't I come back to you, Razi, and say, get your comments on what you've heard from Steve and, and Mark there. Anything which has jumped out there at you to, to add to our up-and-down picture? <laughs> Well, a big theme that we expect in 2016 will, of course, be this great divergence. We saw some easing from Europe at the end of 2015, not as much as the market had been anticipating. And this still came against the backdrop of expectations of Fed tightening. So already we start the year with that divergence in place. And the key question is, what is 2016 actually going to be bringing about? On China, yes, the authorities do face a very difficult challenge. They are trying to rebalance the economy at the same time, trying to manage that slowdown. Nonetheless, we are fairly confident, notwithstanding the events of the last summer, notwithstanding the way the Chinese authorities attempted to deal with um, the deflating of an equity market bubble, there is still quite a lot that China will be doing to try to keep growth going. Chinese policymakers have pledged that by 2020 they want to see GDP double what it was in 2010. And this does imply growth growth rates of at least 6.5 percent or perhaps even higher initially to try to get that sense of confidence that this can be achieved. Of course, we'll have to consider very carefully the tools that are available to the authorities as they try to keep growth going while trying to rebalance the economy, more consumption, perhaps trying to manage that slowdown in investment at the same time. Steve Sang, anything to add to that? Well, I think the Chinese government would love to what she has just said. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reality is rather slightly less rosy. Um, the growth rate requires to achieve the Chinese government objective will indeed need to be at least 6% and preferably higher. Otherwise, they simply cannot double the economy, the economy uh, by 2020, uh, roughly from the 2010-2012 benchmark. Now, how are they going to actually manage that is going to be very, very difficult with the way how the economy is uh, restructuring. I think the one saving grace with 2016 is that if the U.S. economy really rebounds very strongly, mm. then it's likely to produce higher demands. And that would be helpful to the Chinese export industries. So that, in a, in a sense, moves a bit away from what the Chinese government would like to do. They want to be less dependent on export and more dependent on domestic consumption. But that is not necessarily what they are going to get. And they would want to have any other uh, stimulations to economic growth that they can get. As to the property market, that is a very, very big can of worm mm. in the Chinese situation. Uh, they know that. The property market is very inflated. But how to manage it down is extremely difficult and delicate. And they really can't actually afford to manage it down very much because if they do so, domestic demand for consumption is going to drop like a rock. Mm. They can't afford that. So they will have to allow the, stock, the property market to be maintained.
Right. Emerging markets, one of you mentioned it before, so let's move on to those. Razi, I know you can talk to us about African economies, but I'll come to you in a second. Mark, first of all, seeing as you were uh, a former ambassador to Turkey, tell me about Turkey. We've looked at Turkey on counting the cost in 2015 and the sort of precarious position it has been in. Uh, tell me about your thoughts for its future in 2016. Well, there is a huge paradox right now in, in Turkey. The uh, president, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and his party of origin, the AKP, seem to be at the top of their game. They were elected respectively in, in August 2014 and in November 2015. Uh, they control uh, the politics and, and Erdogan himself has been the towering figure in the Turkish politics for 13 years. Uh, so it all seems picture perfect, mm. but in reality it is not so because uh, first of all internally there is a clampdown on the media, on the judiciary, on the Kurds, uh, all linked to domestic politics, obviously. Mm. So that is not uh, a very stable and rosy picture. And externally, well, no need to describe. Mm. You have Syria, you have the Russian intervention in Syria. Uh, ISIS is very big uh, and growing, expanding geographically. Uh, there are repeated calls from the US, from the West, from Russia itself uh, for Turkey to close the border tightly with, with ISIS and Turkey is reluctantly making slow progress in that direction. Mm. So, but with um, all that, all that going is, on, an how, extremely does it, complex picture. how does it focus on its own economy and looking after its own people? Because as I said at the start of the show, it's the economy, stupid. That's what matters all the time. It's jobs and the economy. And I wonder, Turkey's uh, attention seems to be elsewhere. If you look at the AKP tenure for the past 13 years, they've made extraordinary strides. They have uh, expanded the infrastructure, the social infrastructures, hospitals and airports, uh, everything. Uh, and then they have expanded uh, consumption to an mm. enormous extent. But of course, there are dangers there. And, and we know that in 2015, in 2014 as well, there was a huge uh, battle within uh, the government between Erdogan as Prime Minister first and then President, and the uh, Vice Prime Minister for Economy, Babajan, and then uh, now Shimshek, uh, so has to, to, to see whether they control credit or not. Mm. And this is an extremely difficult uh, situation because the President wants people to continue buying, to get credit, easy credit, and of course that is not very reasonable in the medium and long term, mm. especially with the Fed uh, tightening uh, on, on money supply. So yeah. it, it is uh, very difficult. The growth is, is slowing down in Turkey and foreign direct investment is slowing down. Mm. Razia, Africa, in fact, South Africa, what a mess at the end of 2015 with the shake-up of finance ministers and the like. I mean, S South Africa is one of the BRICS nations, but it doesn't feel like one at the moment. It feels a bit rudderless, economically speaking. Well, South Africa has certainly been through a very challenging time and that wasn't helped by the foreign exchange volatility seen right at the end of the year with that attempt to replace South Africa's well-regarded finance minister uh, with a relative unknown. And this, of course, took the intervention of a lot of private sector players expressing their concerns internally within the ruling ANC. There was a great deal of discussion and we saw after a few days another finance minister emerging, the former finance minister Praveen Gordon, also very well regarded. For 2016, the key focus is going to be on local elections. What we saw at the end of last year was essentially the ANC saying that some of those decisions had not been taken in isolation. Mm. Now, whether that is the case or not, whether the electorate go with it or not, there has been this deep-seated discontent about economic performance. The South African economy looks as though it's had two straight years of growth of only around 1.5%. That's negligible. There will be pressure, especially from urban constituencies, to see a more rapid rate of growth, to try to move South Africa along from this place of very weak growth, where it seems to have been stuck since the global financial crisis. It's not clear that the authorities have very much that they can use in the way of monetary policy stimulus. That's going to be limited.
limited, fiscal policy, the recent ratings action that South Africa was subjected to, a downgrade to the lowest rung of investment grade by Fitch ratings. That means there really isn't the room to try to spend their way out of this weak growth position. And this creates great challenges for the ANC government going forward. Right, before we run out of time, final topic I want to deal with with the three of you is oil. And I think I can safely say that this affects everybody. And we've talked about this fall in the oil prices for a very long time. Steve Sang in Nottingham, I will start with you. And maybe even resources uh, as a wider uh, story, because we saw the, the job cuts at Anglo-American recently because of, of, of um, a falling commodity prices. How might this affect China uh, and the Asia region? Tell me about that. Cheaper oils is, in a sense, rather useful for the Chinese economy. Um, it may perhaps even help them to slightly reduce the use of coal. But there is a structural size to the uh, production of energy in China, so they will still be very heavily dependent on coal. Mm. But they could start to sort of turn to relatively less polluting uh, sources of energy with cheaper oil being available. Um, but there's also issues in terms of um, the Chinese oil companies, therefore, themselves are not doing quite so well. And that is not a very positive thing for them. But they are so heavily dependent on energy in terms of the growth of the economy, mm. I think it would, on balance, be a more positive thing for them. Mark Perini, let's talk oil in the sense of the Middle East. You were a former ambassador to some Middle East countries, Russia as well. It seems to me like 2016, these countries are really going to have to think about their financial structures because oil is not going to be providing what it used to. The income from oil and, and gas is, is uh, shrinking and uh, they are really worried. On top of that, uh, you have uh, a difficult situation looming in Libya where uh, in the middle of Libya, ISIL has a stronghold in the city of Sirte, might move east to cut off uh, the oil terminals there, or might, might move uh, west, west of Tripoli, where you have the gas pipeline going directly into Italy. Mm. Uh, so uh, it doesn't look as very big in terms of percentage of supplies for the whole of Europe, but for a country like Italy or for certain oil companies, uh, getting, uh, unloading uh, uh, very light uh, crude from Libya, so very profitable business, mm. that may get into very big trouble. Then, of course, the situation with Russia, Russia is uh, yeah. perhaps more unpredictable than, than ever before. And Razia, Africa, I'm thinking about nations like Nigeria. Oil is so important. We've talked so often about how it's not delivered in the past due to issues like you know, infrastructure and corruption. You add in a lower price to that, and those economies are really going to take a hit. Well, yes, Nigeria faces a very pivotal year in 2016. And in a sense, the year of lost growth, we've already seen that. 2015 was the year of adjustment to weaker oil prices. Nigeria had a landmark election. It brought in a completely new government. That's a first since its transition to civilian rule. So the key question for 2016 in Nigeria is how much economic reform is going to be possible. Will Nigeria be able to rise above this? There are challenges certainly with the weakness of the oil price but that might also be the opportunity for Nigeria. 2016 could well be the year where Nigeria focuses on longer term structural reforms, addresses the issue of fuel subsidies, perhaps some element of liberalization in the foreign exchange rate that brings back that foreign in uh, investor interest. Nigeria's potential has always been seen as an economy that is about a lot more than oil. It is Africa's largest economy. It has the largest population. It has amazingly positive demographics to mm. attract any investor. But it's this inability to get away from that perceived oil curse, the rentier economy. This is where the governance reforms that are put in place in Nigeria will be very important to outcomes in 2016 and perhaps for the much longer term as well. Steve Sang, Razia Khan and Mark Parini, so much more we could talk about, but we're out of time, I'm afraid. I do want to thank you for your time and we will look forward to speaking to you all again in 2016. Thank you.
And that is our first show for 2016, but there's more for you online, of course, at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That takes you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. Do get in touch with us as well. Uh, you can tweet me at KamalAJE and use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or just drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Oh,